Welcome to the dispersed workshop, Missionary Objects and Collecting 16th, 20th Centuries. I am Sabina Brevaglieri, and I'm thrilled to launch a talk series I have designed and conveyed as a first step into a project aiming to contribute to the collective undertaking of thinking the future of non-European objects and collections in Europe today. This set of talks explore the missionary engagement with objects and collecting through time and space. Missionary object is an operational concept which draws the attention to the complex dynamic of both physical mobility and cultural transformation, which permeate the tension between objects produced and belonging to local indigenous communities around the world and the missionary agency. The complex entanglement between missionary object and collecting and the competitive and conflictual colonial spaces is a major issue for this war. Indeed, colonial logics, asymmetrical power relations and jurisdictional competition can hardly be separated from missionary action. However, missionaries are religious actors and their experience and personal engagement in the local field are integral to apostolic commitment and evangelization purposes. Religion emerges as substantial driving force in shaping the complex meaning of missionary objects, as well as in continuously reconfiguring them in their context. This series engages with missionary practices of object attention, selection, accumulation and monopolization, creative practices of resistance, keeping alive the indigenous worship have been addressed, as well as anti-idolatry campaigns aimed at the physical material destruction or epistemic aggression of the sacred matter. Such violent actions generated complex forms of missionary knowledge on indigenous objects, which mediated their agency into the colonial archives and museums. Missionary travels and circulation across the world triggered complex perception and reception dynamics. Display and exposition create new publics. Competing patrimonialization processes underpin the current question of object preservation as an entangled right, the objects and bodies. The talks investigate South and Mesoamerica, Philippines, China, Ethiopia, the Congo, as well as Italy and Rome. The series provide the possibility to compare different forms and situations of missionary engagement by focusing on Franciscans, Dominicans, Jesuit and Capuchins, as well as Saverians. The talks argues for a long lasting missionary attention to objects and engagement with collecting practices. Still existing objects today preserved in European museums are being addressed as material evidence of discontinuous and often invisible dynamics of both eradication and sedimentation, which reconfigure their meanings, uses, and values through time. Therefore, talks tricks back to the 16th centuries and early modern times, aiming to unravel object histories and meaning well beyond the culture of curiosity. Within this framework, the 19th and 20th centuries missionary museological thinking have been addressed and under investigated missionary museums imbued with ethnocentric connotation and strong colonial imagination are being explored. These exploratory series concentrate on the Catholic world to draft both an innovative research agenda and new methodological tools, which has to be expanded through comparison and entanglement with other denominations and religions. This dispersed workshop represents an attempt to overcome separation between disciplines and scholarly communities and foster dialogue of cooperation and partnership between universities and museums. I would like to warmly thank all speakers, institutional partners, colleagues and participants for such a collective undertaking. I wish you a stimulating 
visit through the dispersed workshop missionary objects and collecting. Enjoy the talk. Thank you very much, Sabina, for the invitation to present uh, this paper. I also thank Professor Trencusio for uh, hosting um, digitally this, this uh, event. I'm very sorry I could not uh, go to Rome uh, in time, but uh, the times are very strange <laughs> for everyone. I hope to, to be able to go to Rome again soon. Um, and I'd like, of course, to thank uh, Loretta Pereni um, and uh, Filippo Comiso for being here, um, for allowing me to talk about part of uh, their collection <laughs> that is so, um, yeah, well, it's so important um, um, for me as a researcher coming from Brazil and also for, for my team to be able to do this. Um, speaking of my team, I'd like to introduce to you Leandro Matthews Cascon. He was here already. Uh, maybe if you, uh, yeah, there he is saying hello. <laughs> He's a postdoctoral researcher um, in my um, ERC uh, project and a co author of this paper and presentation. So uh, he's also here. I'm happy he could be. And I'll be showing a little bit about uh, the work we did, uh, we are doing, in fact, um, with Kirsch's collection at the Museo Pigorini. Um, and I understand I should no longer say Pigorini, but Museo della Civilità. So I apologize for all along the paper having written Pigorini. So I, I will correct this, um, but uh, just because of uh, historically speaking, I, I am used to something else. So um, anyway, thank you everyone. And um, well, I, I will read a little bit and talk a little bit. Um, so this will be a, a shorter version of, of the paper that I uploaded um, last weekend. So, um, in fact, whoops, see, uh -huh. how do I make this? Oh, yeah. So, in fact, this paper, the research for this paper, uh, started with a question that uh, Sabina posed to me uh, in Rome in December 2018, when, when we met for the first time. Uh, she asked me if in the course of my research on early modern collections, the research I did for that book, um, if I had found any collections or objects collected by or belonging to missionaries in Brazil. And uh, the next day, coincidentally, I had a visit planned to the Museo Pigorini, where I was welcomed very generously by uh, Dr. Donatella Saviola, whose help and generosity I also acknowledge here in, in um, allowing us uh, to, to access the collection uh, many times in, in the course of the last uh, two or three years. So with, with Donatella, we discussed the museum's Brazilian collection and all of its research possibilities. There's, there's a, more than a lifetime of possibilities <laughs> of research there. Um, and that was my first encounter with Kirsch's Brazilian objects and my first step into trying to answer Sabina's question. So I started looking into it. And um, of course, while we can assume with a certain degree of certainty that many of the historic indigenous Brazilian objects presently kept at museums originate from missionary and specifically Jesuit exchanges and network, given the Jesuit importance in Brazil, and I'll talk about it soon, uh, the reconstruction of these early modern collections demand a detailed comparison between primary sources, ethnographic descriptions, museum catalogues, and the analysis of museum objects. So for the case of Brazil, one must start, and perhaps one must start turning to Sonia Dota's 1992 inventory, which so far is the most complete list of indigenous Brazilian collections in museums. She located and listed no less than 191 collections made between the mid 16th and the mid 20th century in Brazil. Of those collections, missionary ones are a little more than a handful and, the, and include only one example from the early modern period, that of Father Athanasius Kirchi. Dota describes his collection as comprising six objects, namely weapons and an apron coming from the Tapuia or from the Kiriri people, and a bracelet coming from the Rio Negro region. The bracelet, she adds, was not mentioned by Bonani in his 1709 publication, a matter to which um, we will return. 
Kircher's Brazilian objects have also appeared in two catalogs published in the 1980s, in the occasion of the exhibition Indios del Brasile and um, in the Museo Pigorini in 1983, and uh, another book coming from the same effort of cataloging Brazilian indigenous objects in Italian museums uh, called A Italia e o Brasil Indígena. So this first, the first catalog included three of Kircher's Brazilian objects, um, a club, a bow, and an apron or belt decorated with seed beads and human teeth. The second book refers only to the bow and to the apron or belt. And I'll come back to these specific objects later um, in this talk. Now, these are works from the 1980s and 1990s that made uh, an incredible um, effort and, and that we still um, well have to go to when looking at Brazilian collections. But recent research on missionary collecting activities in Brazil and in the greater Amazon region is now opening up museum storage rooms, libraries, and archives to review a much wider picture of missionary collecting in the region. For example, the discovery by Samuele Taconi of documents pertaining to the history of a mid 18th century indigenous collection from the upper Amazon adds chronological depth to our knowledge of Jesuit, Jesuit engagements in the area and offers verified historical and geographical context to a number of objects presently kept at the Museo Pigorini uh, and the Museo Civico Medievale in Bologna. Um, likewise, anthropologist Rafael de Oliveira Rodriguez has written about the Franciscan missionary Giuseppe Coppi, who worked in missions of the Upper Rio Negro in the late 19th century and whose confrontation with the Tariana people resulted in his expulsion from the region. This confrontation included the confiscation by Copi of a number of objects related to indigenous sacred rituals seen by the Franciscans as idols. Copi's collection of items of idolatry later became part of the holdings of the Pigorini. Influenced by the new historiography of the indigenous peoples in Brazil, this recent literature also complexifies the picture of missionary collecting practices in lowland South America by paying attention to the centrality of indigenous actions and agendas in their engagements with missionaries. In an attempt to contribute to this growing literature on missionary collections, this paper addresses Jesuit collecting practices and choices in colonial Brazil through the case of its most famous example, Father Athanasius Kirche. The aim of the paper is twofold. First, to discuss what might have been the Brazilian objects in Athanasius Kircher's collection, and second, to specify which objects presently kept at the Museu Pigorini may have belonged in his collection. The paper thus moves from past to present, and then from present to past back again working from a hypothetical Kircher Brazilian collection towards the present day storerooms of the Museu Pigorini. This movement in time, back and forth, will hopefully prove useful as it allows us to reconstruct the possibilities and reasons for Jesuit collecting in Brazil, reconnecting it at least partially to the objects that still survive in museum collections. So in the first part of the paper, um, we discuss a selection of Jesuit letters from the 1550s and 1560s, the first few decades of the Society of Jesus in Brazil. These letters exemplify the conflictive nature of Jesuit engagement with indigenous Tupi and other peoples in Brazil, and expose the types of objects that most caught their attention, providing a series of possible pictures of what objects the Museu Quixeriano could have had either inherited from older missionary collections or received directly from Brazil. In the second part of the paper, we present the entries on Brazilian objects, animals, plants in the writings of Giorgio de Seppi and Filippo Bonani and discuss what these descriptions reveal about the inclusion of Brazil and its inhabitants into Kircher's collection. In the third part of the article, we turn to the present day collection of the Museu Pigorini and attempt to identify which of the objects now ascribed to the Fondo Quixeriano might have indeed belonged to him. 
We do so based on comparisons between historical and ethnographic descriptions of indigenous material culture and the material qualities of the objects we had the opportunity to see in our visits to the museum. And now in this slide, you see some of us or most of us in our visit, our first, no, our second visit to the museum. You see Leandro next to him, the gentleman in a red pink shirt, t-shirt is um, Felipe van der Velden. He's a Brazilian anthropologist um, um, working in Brazil, uh, but also in collaboration with our project. There's me in the middle and in the third picture, there's Filippi again. And in the back, you see Beber van der Oord. She's an MA student of mine um, working precisely with the Seppi and Bonani's uh, collection of um, catalogs of the collection. So in these visits, we were also able to, together with uh, Dora, Donatella Saviola, obtain samples from three objects for complement, complementary laboratorial analysis. So uh, we took pictures um, of everything very carefully. Leandro actually took very careful pictures. Um, you see one of those here of me taking a picture of him taking a picture. So one of those meta things that anthropologists like. Um, and then a, uh, an image of the samples we collected. And those samples were taken basically from, um, from the parts of the objects that had already fallen apart. So when, when we opened, um, the, 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 let's say the, the, when the objects were presented to us and opened from their cases, um, the small parts that had already fallen were collected um, to be used for um, sampling. And we'll get to that later in the third part uh, of the article. So I, I feel um, very nostalgic to working on uh, museum store rooms. It's been so long for all of us. Anyway, I start with the first part, Catholic missionaries in Brazil. So the Jesuit order arrived in Brazil in 1549, when Portuguese King Dom João III sent six missionaries to Bahia, together with Tomé de Souza, the first governor of the colony. Under leadership of Father Manuel da Nóbrega, the first provincial of the Society of Jesus in Brazil, Jesuits then began their long presence in a colony, a history marked by the creation of churches, seminaries, and missions, eventually leading to the foundation of cities such as Salvador da Bahia and São Paulo. Their fundamental work in the colony, however, was the subjugation and conversion to the Catholic faith of the many indigenous populations living in the territory. The Society of Jesus, in fact, played a central role in the colonization of the land as creators and drivers of the processes of aldeamento. Aldeias were Jesuit controlled villages where members of different indigenous groups were forced to live together and undergo conversion, often um, in the decimentus uh, processes. At first, coastal populations belonging to different Tupi speaking groups were subjugated into the system of forced labor and evangelization in the aldeas. Soon thereafter, the Je Jesuits also created missions in the interior parts of the territory, thereby engaging more directly with non Tupi peoples, oftentimes called Tapuya. Importantly, these two terms, Tupi and Tapuya, came to represent a false dichotomy between pacified, subservient indigenous Tupi groups and their contrasting counterpart, the barbaric, wild, and dangerous Tapuya. This dichotomy, moreover, suggested an erroneous and unfortunately long-lasting representation of indigenous peoples as static entities, living on untransformed since pre-contact times. As we will see below, 17th and 18th century collection catalogs often repeated these terms, sometimes substituting Tupi for Tupinamba and vice versa, and sometimes using Kiriri and Tapuya interchangeably, especially in the case of Kirche. A detailed discussion of what these terms meant, and especially what they hid away, is beyond the scope of this paper. For now, suffice to say that the indigenous identity terminology used in early modern collection catalogs deserve further scrutiny uh, 
as part of the study of the provenance of indigenous objects. So I'm saying uh, we shouldn't throw away the baby with the, with the bathwater, saying, well, those early modern catalogs um, don't tell us anything about the, about the, the ethnic um, attributions or identities of objects. No, I'm saying we have to look at them carefully, how they help to construct certain ethnic identities and not orders, others for specific objects. And, and Leandro is uh, specifically um, studying that uh, in, in one of the papers he's preparing. So uh, we can talk about that later. Back to the Jesuits. In their copious correspondence with their superiors in the order, governmental authorities and the Portuguese crown, the Jesuits referred to the many elements of indigenous material culture whose making and use they were able to witness. An important aspect of these descriptions has to do with the characterization of indigenous peoples as warmongers, so that weapons are an often recurring element in the narratives. In fact, the indigenous mode of war making and particularly the Tupinamba war forms, which included the taking of captives for killing and later ritual consumption, became one of the most persistent tropes of early modern writing about the natives of Brazil. And you will all be very familiar with this image. In his introduction to the monumental compilation of Jesuit documents pertaining to Brazil, Serafim Leite summarized the priest's early portrayal of Tupinamba peoples as, open quote, and this is Portuguese, um, Sempre tem guerras com outros e andam to todos em discórdia e comem-se uns aos outros. Os gentios põem a sua bem-aventurança em matar os seus contrários e comer carne humana e ter muitas mulheres. So, so, so basically, the, the indigenous peoples are, are warlike, they like to fight with each other, they fight each other all the time, they eat each other all the time and they are happy in doing so and in taking many women. Moreover, he continues, anthropophagy is not limited to ritual killing and consumption, as when they are old and dying, indigenous peoples ask for human flesh, and if you don't give it to them, they die unconsoled. As a matter of fact, and unsurprisingly, Early Jesuit writings about indigenous Brazil are loaded with references either to the ritual, festive, or funerary consumption of human flesh and, how, and to how conversion to the Christian faith was therefore not only necessary, but also particularly difficult to achieve. So, so this is also a very common trope in early Jesuit writing about Brazil, the dif difficulty to um, convert and keep them converted, especially. So in this context of describing war, it is not surprising that weapons such as bows, arrows, spears, and clubs are mentioned by the Jesuits, and as we will see, became part of early modern collections made in Brazil. Writing about the Aimoré, a people who waged war on the Tupiniquim and Tupinambá of the southeast of the colony, Padre Manuel da Nóbrega stated, um, traen un arco muy fuerte en la mano y en la otra un palo muy grueso, con que pelean con los contrarios y fácilmente los despedazan y huyen para los matos." End quote. In 1563, Father José de Anchieta reported about Indians in the region of São Paulo de Piratininga fighting against Portuguese Christians using una espada de payo muy pintada y ornada de plumas de diversos colores que es señal de guerra. Um, he also mentioned a similar painted wooden sword decorated with feathers with which the warrior can break the enemy's skull. The same type of weapon had already been mentioned a decade earlier by brother Pedro, uh, Pedro Coimbra, who gave an almost painful description of how indigenous men killed their captive enemy after a days long ritual by repeatedly beating on the captive's head with una espada de pario que será de nueve dispalmos muy pintada. And this image might also um, be um, somewhat familiar. It's uh, taken after Jean de Lerie. And here you see um, a bit of a grotesque yet uh, persistent depiction of um, a Brazilian indigenous person with 
one such a wooden sword, um, or actually a club decorated with feathers. Objects made of birds' feathers and body decoration with colorful, colorful, colorful plumes are an important part of these 16th century narratives. Writing to the Jesuits in Coimbra, Father Leonardo Nunes described having been chased by a group of indigenous men in a canoe near the port of São Vicente, who had mistaken him and his Portuguese companions for French enemies. Todos andaban desnudos, como es costumbre de todos, de ellos tenidos de negro y otros de colorado, y otros cubiertos de plumas o covered in feathers, um, uh, y no cesaban de tirar flechadas con grande grita, y otros tenían unos bucios con que hacen alarde en sus guerras, que parecía el mismo infierno, y así nos perseguieron pasante the tres horas. So the, again, the depiction of, uh, of a warlike people and, and this inferno scenario of, of um, arrows and, and everything. Also writing from São Vicente a year later, Brother Pedro Correa described the ceremonial preparations for the killing of the captive, um, saying, y en las cabezas ponen diademas de plumas de colores muy bien hechas y otras muchas invenciones. So again, feather work. Feather work is connected to the ritual killing of the enemies, as written by Father Antonio Blasquez in 1559 about the already converted indigenous peoples of the Villa de San Pablo. And he says, Porque estas plumas que ellos te tienen son las mejores aliajas que ellos tienen y de ellas usaban cuando mataban los contrarios y los comían, haciendo de ellas sus capas y otros trajes con que se vestían. In how far do these observations and descriptions of indigenous material culture by early Jesuit authors reflect missionary collecting practices? And how much do they inform us about Kircher's Brazilian objects? Well, there are no straightforward answers to these questions. Yet, these early Jesuit letters and later the scholarly reflections um, by Serafim Leite and Florestan Fernandes, among many others, about their historiographical and ethnographic potentials, allow us to visualize the types of objects that caught Jesuits' attention, which was, of course, determined by their prominent place within indigenous ritual practices and warfare. I'll go to the second part of my presentation. By the 1630s, when Kircher started making his own collection, the Jesuit vision of an engagement with indigenous peoples in Brazil had been underway for almost 100 years, and the description of barbaric customs had given space to narratives of conversion, captivity, forced labor, and other such matters, revealing the establishment of a certain type of routine Jesuit work. This is not to say that indigenous cultural practices were completely abandoned or that the conversion had been successful. The history of indigenous peoples in Brazil is a much more complex combination of forms of resistance and cultural transformations. While the reports coming from the colony brought less and less shocking cult cultural novelties, the business of collecting the Americas continued to, de to develop in Europe in full swing. As for Atanasius, Atanasius Kirchen himself, um, the origins of his Brazilian collections, uh, of his Brazilian objects, certainly lie within his huge network of correspondents in the colony and elsewhere, who sent news and gifts to Rome from the Colégio da Bahia and from São Vicente, present day São Paulo. Father Valentin Stanzo is known to have been one of Kirchner's Brazilian correspondents, but their letters uh, deal more with matters of astronomy than those that today we call ethnography. Unfortunately, while we know that Kircher had more correspondence in Brazil, we have not yet found evidence of the gifts that uh, may have accompanied the letters. The best historical evidence pointing to Kircher Braz Brazilian objects are the two published catalogues of the late 17th and early 18th centuries, the Sepi and Bonani. Sadly, it does not seem like, like Kircher was particularly curious about Brazil, as opposed to the interest he had in China and Egypt. 
This is clearly seen in Giorgio de Seppis, the celebrated museum of the Roman College of the Society of Jesus, also known as the Seppis Catalog of Kircher's Museum, published in Amsterdam in 1678. According to Paula Finglen, Kircher played a role in the shaping of this particular book, which was, open quote, an opportunity to represent the experience of the Roman College Museum for eternity, end quote. If we are to believe Kircher's and the Seppi's intentions of showcasing the highlights of the museum to the catalog reader, Brazil was certainly not amongst the top choices. The book contains just a few references to animals, plants and objects brought from the Portuguese colony in the Americas. Yet, Brazil provided some good examples of wondrous objects that materialize the barbaric customs of the populations whom the Jesuits tried so hard to convert. Moreover, the descriptions often emphasize how these items had been sent as gifts to Kircher directly from Brazil, thereby highlighting the network of scholars that Kircher cultivated around himself and adding legitimacy and authority to his descriptions and ultimately to his museums, to his museum. The Seppi's description of wonders starts with the colorful Brazilian birds. In fact, early modern Europeans fashion, fascination with tropical birds and their colorful feathers equaled, if it did not surpass, that of the indigenous peoples who attributed su supernatural powers to the wearing of feather capes. And that's, that's a comparison worth um, pursuing in the future, I suppose. The Seppi also mentions Brazilian bread made of manioc or yucca flour and vases made of American gourds, probably calabashes, which were another Brazilian plant-based object that commonly was commonly collected in the period. The most interesting passage of the Seppi's catalog regarding a Brazilian object, however, is the description of a belt decorated with seed beads and human teeth. This object will persistently appear in later catalogs of Kircher's museum and is perhaps in all of Kircher's Brazilian possessions that we know of so far, the most intriguing. For now, however, let us turn to the Seppi's description. So as you can read in the slide, the final exhibit consists, consists of torques or belts of the barbarians or cannibals of Brazil, etc., etc. But the Torquati of Brazil should be given this name more accurately as they extort the very skin of their enemies and for their spoils, the ivory of human teeth from a neckband, which is made into a kind of bandage from palm cloth or from a waistband woven from hemp. They hang on ribbons of palm like seeds of juniper and it hangs conspicuous with human teeth. For glorying in this multitude of teeth, they vaunt the crimes of their barbarity. For the number of teeth these girdles contain signifies the number of people they have devoured as the sign of a superior mind. And they wear these as cover for their pubic area. So that's, that's a pretty heavy loaded description of the object, which I will show you um, very soon. When explaining the function of the museum of the, of the Collegio Romano within the framework of the Society of Jesus, Paula Finglen again characterizes collecting as, open quote, a tool of religious and cultural accommodation, explaining furthermore that it connected well with the religious impulse to familiarize the unknown for purposes of assimilation and conversion, end quote. Anthropophagy, however, seems difficult to assimilate, and this is a topic that comes back again and again and again in descriptions of these, this and other objects. In 1680, upon Kircher's death, the Museum of the Collegio Romano could not be kept up as the center of learning it used to be under Kircher. Reports from visitors in the late 1680s denounced a museum in declining state. In the early years of the 18th century, Jesuit naturalist Filippo Bonani took over the custodianship of the museum and implemented changes and improvements to the building, added to the collection, and in 1709, published a new catalog to mark the revival of the museum, the Museo Kircheriano. 
Bonani's catalog is different to that of the SEPI in many ways, perhaps most visibly in its extent and in its dialogue with works of natural philosophy and natural history from antiquity and from the early modern era. While Brazil, again, does not hold a prominent place in the description of the museum's holdings, there are many more Brazilian objects and animals here than can be found in the SEPI's earlier listing. Bonani starts his chapter on the collection of exotic objects precisely by describing a belt of the barbarous Brazilians and discussing the anthropophagic practices which it represents. He calls it open quote, open quote open quote, the loincloth of the barbarians of Brazil. This is a band with the width of a palm woven from some kind of thread from which hang threads as many as possible extended to a palm and a half covered with small black balls as if with the seeds of pepper and every one of them bears human teeth, end quote, end quote. He goes on to question whether or not the teeth could really represent the number of the number of people the wearer of the belt or the maker of the belt had actually eaten, thereby diverging from the Sepi's narrative. So the question seemed to be, the question seemed to be, what do these teeth really represent? And I suppose you will see very soon in the third part that the question also persists to us as researchers today. In the same chapter, objects stand alongside birds and bird feathers, often discussed in connection to objects made of those materials, as for instance, the Brazilian parasol made of ostrich feathers, which can be opened and closed like an European umbrella, a fan made of red feathers from the bird called Guará in Brazil. The parasol must have come from a location other than Brazil, as this type of material culture was not found amongst indigenous peoples of lowland South America. The fan made of red feathers, however, could have been one of the many types of feather work, such as headdresses, capes, arm or leg ornaments, necklaces, etc., produces by, produced by indigenous peoples and eagerly sought after by 17th century Europeans as collectibles. Bonani's attention to birds and feather work in general, from Brazil to Mexico, clearly indicate the awareness and involvement of Kircher and Bonani with the collecting spirit of their time, their access to the most prized items in the collecting market. However, and very interestingly, neither the Sepi nor Bonani described the feather fan or the colorful birds in connection to the themes of war or anthropophagy. This is all the more intriguing, as we know from 16th century missionary and layman's accounts, that one of the most important steps of the anthropophagic ritual was precisely the wearing of a feather cape. This separation between war and ritual on the one hand and birds and feather work on the other could perhaps be explained by the distance in time and space between the act of collection of objects in Brazil amongst indigenous peoples and the later placement and description of indigenous objects in early modern museums. This distance likely created a sort of an epistemic gap between objects and practices, allowing therefore for interpretations more connected to the European visions and representations of new world peoples. The difference between how early Jesuits wrote about indigenous objects, feathered or otherwise, and the way the Sepi and Bonani wrote about them, is furthermore proof of what Davide Domenici has shown for the Dominican records about Mexican objects, that is, the existence of, open quote, a variety of meanings attached to Amerindian artifacts in the diverse cultural and political milieu of early modern Europe, end quote. Brazilian indigenous objects reappear in Bonani's section, Arma Barbarorum Diversa. Here, clubs, axes, bows, arrows, and spears are described for their material composition, their naming, and their use by the barbarians. First two clubs are presented, which are made of black, of a black and heavy type of wood called japema and used by the Tapuya peoples of Brazil. They, open quote, sometimes bind a small bundle of feathers to their end, an ornament they call Atirabebi and Yatirabebi, 
end quote. This is a quotation from George Mark Graf's description of the Tapuya in the Historia Naturalis Brasilia, a book to which Bonani often refers, and reconnects Kircher to the writings of the early Jesuits in Bahia and San Vicente, reporting about wood swords with feather decor decorations. The narrative then continues with detailed descriptions of spears, bows, and arrows, including their names in Tupi language and some information about the circumstances of their use. In this section, it is remarkable how much Bonani deviates from the CEPI's listing and incorporates information from Mark Graf, especially the Tupi names of birds and the names of objects. One last Brazilian weapon is worth mentioning here, as it exemplifies perhaps painfully the practical real life ways in which the Jesuits learned about, reported on, and came to collect indigenous objects. Open quote, he describes an American club of the barbarians from very hard stone fashioned in the manner of optic lenses so that it forms a rhomboid. And because of the thickness or density of its body, a blow increases the vibration. In an opening excised in the middle, a wooden handle of three palms long is inserted. She, the club, is venerable because she opened the entrance to heaven for one of our missionaries, the next having been broken open, as Kircher reports in his museum, page 34. The next sentence, Bonani goes on to add that with the same veneration is preserved the Japanese javelin, with which some from the society had been beaten upon the head. So some cultural comparison there. Despite the tragic circumstances of the victim of the Brazilian club, better described as an ax with wooden handle, this passage exposes an important aspect of missionary collecting in the early colonial times, namely their lived experience amongst indigenous peoples. Missionary writing, when read with the right amount of historiographical skepticism, is an important entryway into indigenous worldviews. Such writings can be used as documentation that helps our understanding of the objects we find in museums today, therefore having the potential, potential to bring us closer to what indigenous realities might have looked like during the early colonial period. Likewise, missionary writing and missionary collections help to write, a more, to write more balanced histories of collecting, where missionary involvement with native societies is part and parcel of an unequal, oppressive system of domination. Sabina was just talking about this. And yet, in the same scenario of inequalities, missionary documentation and its accompanying objects, when we can find them, also help to reveal indigenous peoples as historical agents and missionaries as intermediaries who had to make choices and sometimes were the victims, quite literally, of indigenous actions. So now I go to the last part of my paper. I hope I'm not uh, going on for too long, but now it, it, this is the good, well, also good part. That's where most of the objects will be seen. So the current inventory of the Museo Pigorini currently ascribes six Brazilian indigenous objects to the Fondo Kircheriano. In our research visits to the museum, we were able to see and analyze five of them. The Kiriri ball, uh, the Kiriri ball, so the third one here in this list, uh, being the only exception that we could, could not see. We were able to collect small samples, as I had mentioned earlier, from three of these objects, namely the first one, the bag, the second one, bracelet or necklace, and fourth one, belt or apron. Object 3151 seems to be a cargo bag, cargo, the saco cargueiro, made of palm fibers and manufactured using the wrapped work or enroulé technique. It measures, measures roughly 60 by 46 centimeters. Bonani described a small bag with a wide opening terminating in a sharp point, extending almost four palms made from cords often entangled with each other like a net in Brazil, where the inhabitants call it Ayo. This corresponds roughly to the dimensions and to the format of this bag 3151. 
Likewise, a bag is mentioned in the list of objects transferred from the Museo Custeriano to the newly created Pigorini Museum in, 1860, in 1876 as Sacco di Provigioni Tessuto a Modo di Rete del Brasile. Radiocarbon analysis of this object showed that its raw material comes from a C4 plant, therefore probably a palm species, thereby confirming our observations made during our visits to the museum. The fiber sample from cargo bag 3151, however, provided a calibrated date of 1664 to 1916 AD, which complicates its association to Kircher's collection. Further research is needed to confirm whether or not this object or a similar one ever belonged in the Collegio Romano. Object 3153 is composed of 35 white pendants made of the same material, most probably a gastropod shell, all tied to a thick cotton string composed of four intertwined strings. Each pendant has, rough, uh, has roughly half a centimeter in width and two or three centimeters in length. It greatly resembles necklaces used nowadays by indigenous peoples of the G linguistic stock. This object, or a very similar one, was mentioned by Bonani as a necklace or collar brought from the Brazilian empire in which inhabit the barbarians, Kiriri in the vulgar language, of which the workmanship surpasses the material, because although they lack the proper instruments, they put it together with persistent labor from small pieces of bones, of wild animals, or of muscles. And I'd like to note that I have to check again, but if I'm not mistaken, this is the first time in the documentation where the word kiriri appears. So think about ethnic attribution. Uh, it's very important to, to try and find out why Kiriri appears here in Bonani and not before. Bonani furthermore describes this as being used by women in their wedding, also serving as a form of dowry offered to the groom. He states that it was usually exchanged for a horse, which is a clear indication of the immersion of this object and of the Kiriri people, if this is a Kiriri object, in the co complex system of material and animal exchanges that formed quickly after European colonization. In the list of objects transferred from the Museo Cristiano to the newly created, you find a description of a, a, um, a women's jewel or women's jewelry made with small pieces of shells from the Kiriri in Brazil. Radiocarbon dating of the fiber sample from this necklace or bracelet provided a calibrated date of 1673 to 1944 AD. So similarly to the dates obtained for the cargo bag, these results do not match the historical documentation associated with this object and therefore may cast some doubt on its belonging to the Kircher collection. But more research is needed before we can affirm anything. Here he comes. Object 3167 is a belt or apron with a sash made with twilled weaved light and dark colored cotton producing a zigzag pattern. Both left and right margins of the belt have dozens of cotton strands one millimeter wide and seven to 10 centimeters long and a thicker strand in each end made from inter interweaving the interweaving of four thin strands. The lower margin of the belt has 81 cotton strands of approximately 33 centimeters each and with black beads along their lengths. One strand has a white disc bead and another has two white disc beads, all of three which seem to have been made from shells. Another strand, you can see them here, has a white seed bead. Very interesting details. 65 of these strands feature a human tooth on their lower end, and it is likely that the remaining 16 strands originally had teeth as well. The teeth are all tied to their strands by their roots or central area, but so far one tooth has also shown an incomplete perforation on the crown area. 
and you can see it here. And here I should say that uh, we are uh, working together, we're collaborating with Dr. Andrea waters Rist of Western University in Canada. She's an osteologist and specializes in human teeth. And uh, she has uh, studied the photos we took from this object and has preliminary uh, concluded that there are nine different individuals um, in, in these teeth. So these teeth have belonged, must have belonged to at least nine different individuals of which three were adults and six were non-adults, so infants or um, children. Uh, and there are no old adults uh, in this group. This is complicated, we can talk about it. Um, as, in, as has been discussed above, a similar belt is mentioned by both the Seppi and Bonani, similar belt with human teeth. And this is also the case for the list of objects transferred from the Museo Kisheriano to the newly created Pigorini in the 19th century. Although the SEPI seems to describe it as being made from a palm cloth, radiocarbon analysis of its fiber showed that its raw material comes from a C3 plant, probably cotton. While the belt is attributed to the Kidiri people, so far we have not found any sources on the historic or present day Kidiri people that mention belt or aprons made with human teeth. The use of teeth for artifact manufacturing is, however, found amongst indigenous peoples of the Amazon, namely the Apiacá, the Munduruku, and the Miranha. Courtney Moedajou's description of the Apiacá people for the Handbook of South American Indians describes how some Apiacá men wore belts of animal teeth and that chips, open quote, chips used a large, shiny, white color of shell and large belts of black beads and human teeth, end quote, so very similar. Worn together with a feather diadem, these two objects evidenced the chief's importance and would have been worn when foreigners or unknown visitors were received with precautionary, open quote, furious shouting and warlike demonstrations, end quote. Although brief, this description of the belt of an Apiaca chief presents characteristics similar to what is seen on the Kircher belt or apron. Interestingly, Nimuenda Ju's description of the Apiaca chief's attire also mentions a neck ornament similar to the object discussed just now, the white necklace or bracelet made of shells. At the moment, however, this should be considered as solely a coincidence and not an indication that these two objects would have been collected from the same context. Although Nimuenda Ju does not discuss the origin of the teeth, which would have, in, which would have composed the Napiaka belt, the author states that the teeth found on the Apiaca women's necklaces came from enemies that were the war trophies of their spouses, indicating the relationship between artifact manufacture, ritualized warfare, and trophy hunting. The existence of this connection is even more clearly documented for the Munduruku, a people for, for whom the ritual manufacturing and use of tooth belts was documented, documented in the 19th century. <clears throat> Importantly, another belt with human teeth at the Pigorini is attributed to the Munduruku. This is it. Um, which came from a donation from the Reale Armoria di Torino in the late 19th century. Due to the similarity between these two belts, it would be reasonable um, to imagine that the object attributed to Kircher um, might not have come from a 17th century context, but from a 19th century one, perhaps even from the same collection of the belt attributed to the Munduruku. Radiocarbon dating of two samples from the Kircher belt, however, suggests otherwise. Samples were collected from the cotton fiber and from the black seed beads. The seed sample provided a calibrated date of 1411 to 1449 AD, and the fiber sample a calibrated date of 1442 1612. Considering that both samples came from the same artifact, it is possible, probable even, that the object dates from the 15th century. Such dates clearly demonstrate that this belt existed at the time of Kircher's collection and could indeed have belonged to it. 
Moreover, these dates show that this object was probably manufactured before European colonization of Brazil, a phenomenon which has been documented for other ethnographic objects from the early colonization periods of the Americas, and which is compatible with the importance that these powerful objects may have had in their cultural contexts. Furthermore, the comparison of the Kircher belt with this one, the Munduruku belt, um, allows us to see their shared history, namely the history of the persistence of cultural practices and artifact production during hundreds of years of Western influences and colonizatory process. Um, oh, this uh, should not have been here. Sorry, apologies for the wrong. Uh, slide. <laughs> okay, I'm uh, on, on the last uh, group of ob objects here. Clubs 3168 and 3169 present many similarities and may be regarded as variants of the same type of object. They are of similar size, similar shape, and appear to have had uh, to have the same feather type and colors tied to their lower handles. The clubs appear to be made of a dark wood whose macroscopic characteristics correspond to that of palm trees. Regarding engraved decorations, both clubs have different patterns on their upper extremities and lower handle, and only Club 3169 has engravings along its middle section. It's a, it's a very beautiful object. These two clubs somewhat match the description found in Bonani and briefly discussed above of two sticks or rather clubs made of japema wood by the Tapuya peoples of Brazil. Likewise, the 19th century list of objects transferred to the Museum Pigorini mentions due clave de legno del indigeni de Brasile. It is therefore likely that these two clubs have indeed belonged in the Fondo Quixeriano. We have not collected samples from these two objects because they, they are very intact and, and we didn't want to, um, well, inflict damage <laughs> to them. So, uh, but ra radiocarbon dating may still prove useful in determining, determining these objects' age. Now to conclude, finding Kircher's collection, what now? So in this paper, we have discussed the Brazilian objects in Kircher's collection from three different perspectives. First, we started by exploring Jesuit letters of the first decades of colonization, which allowed us to identify the types of objects that caught Jesuits attention and that could have made their way into 16th and 17th century collections in Europe. It has become clear that indigenous warfare and ritual anthropo anthropophagy while being the main challenges and motivators for the need of Catholic conversion, were at the same time the topic of fascination that led Jesuits to describe clubs, axes, and feather work in beautiful detail. These description, descriptions become very useful for the analysis of clubs, axes, and feather work in present day museum collections, helping to identify techniques of production, materials used, and provenience. Secondly, we presented the items classified as Brazilian in the writings of Giorgio Di Seppi and Filippo Bonani, discussing the similarities and divergences between, divergences, I think, I don't know, between both, and highlighting their understandings of war and anthropophagy as materialized in those objects. Finally, we presented and discussed five objects from the collection of the Museo Pigorini, which are attributed to the Fondo Quixeriano. We compare them with historical and ethnographic accounts in terms of their material properties. And in three cases, we collected samples that were analyzed for radiocarbon dating at the Oxford Oral Lab. The results of the C14 analysis allow us to date one object, the belt with human teeth, as being from the 15th century thereby predating not only Kircher's museum, but also the arrival of the Portuguese in the New World. The analysis of two other samples resulted in less specific dating, ranging from the 17th to the 20th century. None of these results is in itself enough to determine whether or not an object has belonged to Kircher. For this reason, this paper is only a first step in the reassessment of this group of objects and more research is necessary to establish provenance and provenience with any degree of certainty. 
This includes taking on the challenge of Kirsch's corpus correspondence, expanding ethnographic comparisons of the objects, and looking further into the possibilities of laboratorial analysis. We hope to be able to continue this line of work in the years to come. We thank you very much. And here I acknowledge our funder, the ERC um, and Leiden University. Thank you very much.